Hey everyone, welcome. So we're going to go ahead and uh, start this talk titled What Happened to the Human Brain? Uh, John Hummel is here to give this uh, session. And John Hummel got his PhD in the University of Minnesota in Experimental Psychology and Cognitive Science. He was a professor at UCLA from 1991 to 2005 and is currently a professor at the Department of Psychology here at the University of Illinois. His work focuses on how people perceive, represent, learn, and reason about relations. He, his students, and his colleagues conduct both behavioral research with human subjects and computational work using artificial neural networks to simulate relational perception, learning, and thought. So let's go ahead and uh, let's turn on your mic. There you go. Thanks. Can I be heard fairly well? Or do I need to shout as usual? Okay, good. Um, first, I want to thank Cole and the rest of you all very much for inviting me and for having me here. It's nice to see a few friendly faces in the crowd. What I'm going to be talking about today is probably a little bit different from the other things you've been hearing at this conference. Um, but hopefully, the connection to machine intelligence and AI and related things will become uh, transparent by and by. Now, I don't know what the typical format is for these things, but um, as long as it's cool with the organizers, I invite you all to interrupt me with questions, especially arguments, as we go along. <clears throat> So, one of these things is not like the others. They all have great manual dexterity. They all exhibit complex social behavior. They all use tools. They all solve problems. They all pass the, pass the rouge test, which is where you take an animal and when it's sleeping, you put a bit of rouge on its forehead. Then you show it a mirror to see whether it goes, oh shit, what's this? And if an animal passes this test, that's taken as evidence of self-awareness. All these animals pass that test. They all do lots of other things. We all have lots in common with these other great apes. Broadly, all these animals show signs of what you and I would be likely to call intelligence. But in spite of this, only one of these species has developed art science, mathematics, engineering, language. Only one of these species has a knowledge of its own history. Only one of these species has expanded relentlessly across the surface of the globe. <clears throat> Three out of four of these species are threatened with extinction. Whereas the other one enjoys world domination. The question I want to pose today is why? What the fuck happened? The difference between these species becomes especially mysterious. The difference between facing extinction and driving everybody else to extinction becomes especially mysterious when you look at these animals phylogenetically. Biologically, humans and chimpanzees, especially bonobo chimps or pygmy chimps, are so close that a lot of biologists would call us subspecies of the same species. But something weird happened in our evolutionary history that did not happen to our primate cousins. <clears throat> Something weird happened right about here that somehow put us, in, put us in charge and drove the rest of them to near extinction. <clears throat> the question I want to pose is, well, was that? What happened to the human brain? Now, obviously, human brains are larger, but that doesn't really count for much. If you think of some species of corvids, those are crows and parrots, they have tiny brains compared to us, but they're smart animals by a lot of measures. If you look at human brains compared to the brains of other primates, our frontal lobes are especially large. Maybe. Well, this is debatable, as shown in this figure. And even if that's really true, you want to say, yeah, but come on. That's not an answer. What really happened? An answer to the question, what happened to the human brain, has to tell you 
what are our brains doing differently than the brains of these other animals? The answer I want to propose and argue for today is that our brains, but not their brains, do something I'll call role-based relational reasoning. This is thinking based on the relations in which things are engaged, rather than the literal features of those things. And I won't give you a detailed description of that just yet, but I will in a few minutes. And when I do, what I want to invite you to do is reflect on the fact that that capacity, the ability to think about relations, is really what underlies math, science, engineering, and everything else uniquely human. But to illustrate what this role-based relational reasoning thing is, let's look at some cognitive tasks that various kinds of animals can perform. One of the classics is called a match-to-sample task. In this task, you show an animal a sample stimulus, say a red circle. And you've been training this animal for a long time, so it knows in this task what dimension of the stimulus is relevant. In this case, let's say it's color. So you show the animal a sample, and then you show it two alternatives. And the animal's task is simply to choose, by a button press or in some other way, the alternative that matches the sample on the relevant dimension. Okay? Or another way to say it is to choose the sample that's the, uh, to choose the alternative that's the same as the sample. Now, we look at the animals that can do this. Humans, unsurprisingly, can do it. Chimps can do it. Baboons can do it. Monkeys, rats, and pigeons can all do it. Even honeybees can do this. Honeybees can do this task. Feeling less special yet? <laughs> now, you might think, as a naive scientist, aha, this task at least shows that these animals know about the same as relation. Because in order to choose the correct alternative, you have to choose the alternative that's the same as the sample in some relevant way, in this case, color set. But you'd be wrong. You don't have to know about relations to do this task right. Think about it. If you're a honeybee or a rat or a pigeon doing this task, all you have to do when you see the sample, or the, the sample is say to yourself, red, 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 red. And then when the alternatives come along, you just choose red. You don't have to explicitly reflect on the fact that the correct alternative is in any sense the same as the sample. And if you do this experiment a little more carefully, you'll realize that rats and honeybees and baboons aren't reflecting on this. How do you do it more carefully? What you do is you make an explicitly relational version of the task. Let's call it a relational match to sample. So now the sample isn't one figure, it's two. And they stand in some relation to each other. And the alternatives aren't one thing each, they're two things each. And you have to choose the alternative that's relationally the same as the sample. Humans can still do this. In fact, human children find this trivial. My own daughter, when she was three, and I gave her this task, looked at me like, what are you, an idiot? There's got to be some trick. Chimps can sort of do this task. They can do this task with lots of training if and only if you've tried first to teach them language. Now, if you've tried to teach them language, you will have failed because they can't learn grammar. But what you would have succeeded in, pat yourself on the back, is preparing them to perform well on this task. Other chimps that you haven't tried to teach language to will fail at this task. After hundreds of trials, they will fail on this task and they'll be pissed off about it. Baboons, no fucking chance. Monkeys, nope. No rats, no pigeons, no honeybees. Just humans, and maybe language-trained chimps. This task, in contrast to the simple match-to-sample task, does require 
you to understand the relation same as. So that you can understand that the sample really does match the blue alternatives in some abstract sense, even though the colors don't match. So we're starting to get a hint at what this relational reasoning looks like. Let's consider another task you'll find uninteresting because it's so easy. If I ask you, does the red circle on the left go with the blue square or the red circle on the right, once again, you'll think it's a trick question. You'll say, well, it depends, you idiot. In terms of, you know, shape and color, of course, it goes with the red circle. But if, in terms of relative size and location, it goes with the blue square, right? That's a good answer, but your ability to appreciate that it might be a trick question relies on your ability to perceive the relations between these things and to understand them independently of the things that stand in those relations. Because in one case, it's a red circle that's smaller and above, and in the other case, it's a blue square that's smaller and above. Or let's click it up a notch to real analogy. Does the figure on the left Go with the first or second figure on the right. With a second of thought, you can realize it goes with the first figure on the right, not the second figure on the right. I won't bother to explain why, because you all get it. This is rule-based relational reasoning. This you find trivial, and non-human primates find impossible. But it's good not just for the SAT or the GRE. It's good because it gives you all kinds of kick-ass cognitive abilities. A simple example is, if I show you a figure on the left and I tell you that it's analogous to the figure on the right, and I ask you, what color is missing on the right? You say, duh, it's blue. If you try to ask a chimp the same question, it just gets mad and throws poop at you. Humans only can do this. Or you can get even more abstract. If I tell you the figure on the left is analogous to the figure on the right, and I ask you what's missing on the right, you'll say, oh, a circle with four dots on it is missing on the right. No, duh. Shit. Now you're matching color and shape on the left to number on the right? That's super abstract, purely relational. And you have no trouble with it. <clears throat> this ability you have allows you to do other wondrous things. Like if you appreciate the relation, the analogy between the figure on the left and the figure on the right, you can use the two of those together to discover a more generic concept like symmetry. Ah, the thing on the left not only goes with the thing on the right, but the thing they have in common is that they both share the higher order relation symmetry x, y, x for some x, some y. Right? Awesome. but only you. Again, this is not a thing that you do only on the GRE. The analogy is known to play a fantastically important role in the way scientists and computing engineers and everybody else with high paying jobs does their job. One of the most famous examples is from Rutherford who was trying to figure out the structure of the atom. And he noticed that there was evidence that the electrons in an, abit, in an atom orbit the nucleus, much like the planets in the solar system orbit the sun. From this, he inferred that there must be some force implicated. Some force must cause the electrons to orbit the nucleus, just like some other force, gravity, causes the planets to orbit the sun. Pretty sophisticated. Or DNA is famously prone to analogies. One of the earliest was DNA is like a blueprint. Bad analogy. Just goes to show, not all analogies are good. They're hard to make. That doesn't guarantee that they'll be right. A better analogy is DNA is like a computer program. Or more, another recent one from Richard Dawkins is DNA is like a recipe. I like the computer program analogy better. But it's not just scientists and kids taking the SAT who use analogies. It's absolutely ubiquitous in human cognition. The reason is that it's a powerful source of inductive inferences. It tells you in a really creative and powerful way what might be true based on what you already know. And it does this 
in every facet of your life, from the absolutely mundane, like, oh, God, my kids will never eat this for dinner, to the sublime, like the realization that, hey, deductive logic is isomorphic, isomorphic to set theory. Okay? You can found modern predicate logic and then go insane based on this notion. A lot have argued that it's the basis of a lot of creative activity, maybe most or all. And Doug Hofstetter, who I understand came to speak here a few years back, has argued, along with others, that it's really the core of, of human cognition. That pretty much everything we do, if it isn't based on analogy, has computational ingredients in common with it. Now, I had to put this in because of whom I'm talking to. <clears throat> but if you don't see it already, it also, therefore, has key importance for machine intelligence. And it's an importance that I think is, to date, underutilized in machine intelligence. Not that I want you stepping on my grant getting toes. And the reason is that it's a form of inference that goes well beyond even Bayesian, even the most rational statistical inference. It's more powerful than statistical inference. I know, that's heresy. Unlike properly done statistical inference, it's not deductive, so it's not guaranteed to be right. But for that same reason, it's more powerful. And I would suggest that it's helpful or even necessary uh, if you want to meet or exceed human intelligence in a lot of domains. So I said role-based relational reasoning is the shiznit. Well, analogy is role-based relational reasoning. It's sort of the classic example of it. And what I'm arguing here, kind of, is that role-based relational reasoning is what happened to humans. So can we unpack that a little bit? What are the ingredients of this? What does a machine, human or chimp or silicon, have to do to accomplish role-based relational reasoning? Oh! Sorry, let's back up. Why is analogy role-based relational reasoning first? It's relational in the sense that, for example, the electrons correspond to the planets, not because of some featural similarity electrons had in common with planets, but because they both <clears throat> are engaged in the same role of the orbits relation. And it's role-based for the same reason. It's role-based because the electrons correspond to the planets, not the sun. The planets and the sun are both engaged in the orbits relation, but the electrons are engaged in the same role of that relation as the planets, a different role of that relation than the sun is engaged. Okay, now unbacking up. So this is role-based relational reasoning. What does it entail? <clears throat> First of all, pretty obviously, it requires you to represent relations as entities in their own right. This ability enables you to, among other things, recognize that the orbits relation in the context of an electron orbiting a nucleus is the same thing as the orbits relation in the context of the planets orbiting the sun. You've also got to be able to bind arguments to relational roles. This is what allows you to know that the assertion that the planets orbit the sun is not the same thing as the assertion that the sun orbits the planets. The only difference between those is the way the roles are bound to the arguments. Next, if you're going to use this capacity for reasoning, you have to be able to compute mappings based on those bindings. What I mean by that is that you've got to recognize, for instance, that the electrons correspond to, map to, the planets, and the uh, nucleus corresponds or maps to the sun. And you don't get these mappings for free. They have to be computed. Once you've got the mappings, then you can use them to constrain inferences. If you know that the electrons map to the planets, etc., then you can infer that some force must cause the electrons to orbit the nucleus. And finally, another requirement is, and this one's kind of much neglected in the study of analogy and relational thought, you've got to be able to acquire these relational concepts in the first place. They don't come from magic fairies. And with apologies to Jerry Fodor, you're not born with them. They've got to come from someplace. <clears throat> so there they are, the components of relational thought or role-based relational reasoning, 
let's compress these because we're going to come back. We're going to come back to this compressed figure many times. So the question I want to turn to now is: Well, if this is what happened during human evolution, then how did it happen? How does the brain do it? And there have been two broad approaches to trying to understand this in the literature and cognitive science. <clears throat> One is based on the analogy between the mind and a computer program, and the other is based on the more recent analogy between the mind and the neurons that make up the brain. So the analogy to a computer program comes from good old-fashioned AI, with which I assume you're all familiar. The idea is that mental representations, the stuff inside your head, are symbolic data structures, like the data structures inside of a computer. Things such as propositions or frames, schemas, things like orbit, planet, sun. Or the isomorphic convention of labeled graphs. Things like, you know, there exists a node for orbit and nodes for planets and sun, and you stick the links in there in the right order to represent the planets orbit the sun. Notice that in this representational format, relations are explicit entities, right? There it is. It's, a, it's the italicized thing to the left of the parentheses in the propositional notation, or the node representing orbits in the labeled graph. And the bindings are explicit. So in propositional notation, it's positioned within the parentheses. And in labeled graphs, it's the order of the links in the graph. What this means is that the analogy to a computer program very naturally captures the idea of representing relations as entities. And it also captures the bindings of relations to their arguments. That's all good. If you're armed with representations like this, it's straightforward to do symbolic operations on them, like graph matching. So here we have the representation of the planets orbit the sun and a representation of the electrons orbit the nucleus. And if we uh, do a little bit of graph matching, we can figure out that orbit corresponds to orbit, and therefore planets to electrons and sun to nucleus. That's all good. So we can compute mappings based on these bindings, based on the role bindings. Armed with those mappings, we can do relational structured analogical inference by a process variously generally called copy with substitution and generation. So if we add to our knowledge of the planets and sun the fact that some force causes the planets to orbit the sun, then we can infer the isomorphic structure on the right-hand side and make the inference that some force must cause the electrons to orbit the nucleus. So, and, and this inference is constrained by the mappings we discovered in the prior graph matching process. Okay, so we're now computing mappings based on the bindings and making inferences based on those mappings. Very good. What about providing an account of where the relational concepts come in the first place? Well, to my knowledge, this approach has failed on that score. Maybe because people haven't tried, maybe because it's too hard. But, let's face it, the approach is Turing complete, right? So, pay somebody enough and they'll figure out a way to do it. But there's a deeper problem. The deeper problem is that it's not clear how brains would carry out these operations. And brains are what evolution gave us. As a result, this account of how the human mind does what it does, how it accomplishes its awesomeness, provides no insight into what happened. Partially motivated by this, some have turned instead to an analogy between minds and neurons. <clears throat> the idea here is that you represent knowledge not as symbolic data structures, but as patterns of activation over collections of neuron-like computing elements. So let these circles represent neurons. Here, this pattern of activation, where green means active and white means inactive, might represent the planets. And this other pattern might represent the sun. And then you can do various kinds of computations by building weighted connections or synapses between our simulated neurons. Right? So if we build excitatory synapses between the neurons that represent the sun, then what we can do 
for example, is if one of those neurons gets active, it can pass activation to the other ones. Bada bing, bada boom. It can form a kind of pattern completion filling in the full representation of sun. Okay? You can do processing like that, pattern completion. You can also do various kinds of input-output mapping. So if you postulate a set of neurons on the left to represent various inputs, and a set of neurons on the right to represent outputs, and you build connections between them, and you impose some pattern of activation on the input neurons, they'll generate some pattern of activation on the output neurons. That's nice. In fact, you can do a lot with that, and people have. What about representing relations? Well, here's our planets, and here's our sun. Why don't we just postulate some more neurons to represent orbits? So we'll activate orbits along with sun, and that gives us orbit sun. So far, so good. Now we'll activate planets, and we've got orbit planet sun, right? Or not? Wait, is that orbit planet sun, or is that orbit sun planets? The problem with this is that it doesn't capture the roll filler bindings. <clears throat> That's a problem. Since you can't, in this scheme, bind arguments to relational roles, you really can't represent relations. And that means you can't do anything else with it. That is a step backward. Now, you could say, well, that's OK. Uh, this is what we were like before whatever happened. And maybe that's true. It turns out this approach is historically quite good at capturing the cognitive abilities of non-human animals. But it still doesn't provide an account of what happened. But what if we could solve this binding problem? People have tried. And there's two general approaches to representing bindings in a neural net. One is by varieties of what's called conjunctive coding, and the other is what I'll call dynamic binding. Binding, conjunctive coding is binding by place, and dynamic binding is binding by time. You'll see why that is. In conjunctive coding, or binding by location, what you do is you designate separate neurons for separate bindings. So <clears throat> the idea is each neuron would represent a conjunction of a role and a filler. So rather than having nodes or neurons for planets and, nodes and neurons for the sun and neurons for orbits, what you have is neurons for planets bound to the orbital role and neurons for planets bound to the orbited role and neurons for sun and orbiter and nuns for sun neurons for sun and orbit head. And by activating the right combination of these neurons, now you unambiguously have the planets orbit the sun. Or if you want to, you could use this, the neurons to represent the sun orbits the planets. <clears throat> this is instantiated in various sophisticated mathematical ways with which you might be familiar, and I won't go through in detail. It's called tensor products. There's my one equation in the talk. There's more equations in the comments at the end if you're anchoring for some equations. The um, thing about tensor products is they look fancier. Mathematically, they're equivalent to what I described before. And the problem with this approach is that it doesn't actually represent relations as entities in their own right. The reason is that the same role, like the orbital role, or the same filler for that matter, is represented by different neurons depending on the filler or role to which it happens to be bound at the time. So although this approach can sort of, kind of, bind arguments to relations, it can't really represent relations as entities. And as a result, the rest goes down the toilet as well. Now, I should point out, this kind of conjunctive coding is not useless in neural computation. In fact, it's essential. It's useful for things like storage and long-term memory. It's just not sufficient. What you can use instead is a kind of binding by time. So let's imagine that these neurons represent electrons, and these represent the nucleus, and these are orbiter, and this is orbited. And let's put time on the x-axis. Remember that neurons communicate by generating spikes of activity. That's what I've shown here. So every time there's a, a little vertical hatch mark, that's, what, that's the corresponding neuron generating a spike of activity. What this pattern of activation represents is the binding of orbiter, the orbiter role, to the electrons. The orbiter role is spiking at the same time as the electrons, as the electrons neurons are, are spiking. And this 
pattern represents <clears throat> the orbited role spiking uh, at the same time as the nucleus. It's the binding of, elect uh, of orbited to nucleus. So together, these patterns of firing represent the proposition electrons orbit nucleus. Using the same neurons, we could also represent the idea that the nucleus orbits the electrons. Even though it's not true, we can still think it. We add to this neurons for the planet and neurons for the sun, and we can represent the idea that the uh, <clears throat> planets are the orbiter and the sun is orbited, and thereby represent the planets orbit the sun, or the sun orbits the planets. What's crucial about this way of doing the binding is that the very same neurons are representing, for example, the orbiter role of orbits, regardless of whether the planets are orbiting the sun, or the electrons are orbiting the nucleus, or what have you. That's because the binding of the roles to their arguments is carried by when the neurons fire, not by which neurons fire. Instead, which neurons fire is busy carrying the identity, which roles are involved, which arguments are involved. So this approach to representing bindings makes it possible to represent relations as entities in their own right in a neural computing architecture. It also makes it possible to bind arguments to roles of those relations. Does it make it possible to compute mappings based on those bindings? What I pose, the question if the answer were no? Actually, I might, because I'm kind of like that. <clears throat> Better still, can we get mappings from this kind of representation using ingredients we already know systems of neurons can do? Something like, for example, memory retrieval. That question is posed by, it is suggested by the following sort of hypothesis or very reasonable conjecture, which is that whatever it was that happened to the human mind must have happened to something that was already there. Evolution doesn't invent new solutions from whole cloth. So, how can we use this kind of approach to simulate memory retrieval? Well, first, let's talk about how we can use it to simulate storage, because before you can retrieve something, you've got to be able to store it away. There's our patterns representing various concepts on the left, as before. Let's store the electrons concept into long-term memory just by building a neuron for it. We'll call it E, and hooking up excitatory syn synapses between that E neuron and all the features of electrons. And we'll do the same thing for the nucleus, the planets, the sun, the orbiter role of the orbit's relation and the orbited role of the orbit's relation. Now, armed with those units, we can sort of start storing bindings in long-term memory, too. So if we want to store the binding of electron to orbiter into long-term memory, what we'll do is we'll build a neuron for electron plus orbiter, and we'll just build excitatory synapses between that neuron and the ones for electron and orbiter. Likewise, for nucleus and orbited, and so forth. Now, if we're going to build electron and orbiter and nucleus and orbited together into a proposition, we just build another neuron with more excitatory connections, more excitatory synapses. And that neuron at the top, or on the right, will represent the proposition orbit electrons nucleus. With similar operations, we can encode into the long-term memory planets orbit the sun. While we're here, let's add some inhibitory connections between those guys sort of in the middle just because we'll need them later. OK. <clears throat> so in this representation, we have full-blown propositions on the right of the figure. We have sort of encodings of role bindings in long-term memory just to the left of that, encodings of objects and relational roles to the left of that, and at the bottom, we have sort of the semantic content of objects and relational roles. What we're going to do is use con conjunctive binding for storage and long-term memory. <clears throat> and at this level, where the bindings are no longer conjunctive, we're going to represent the bindings by time, like we showed in the previous graph, or figures, whatever. So armed with this storage mechanism, how do we do retrieval? <clears throat> 
well, let's activate a few neurons on the left and see what happens. They'll activate the neurons with which they have excitatory connections, which will activate the neurons with which they have excitatory connection, bada bing, bada boom. By activating the feature of orbiter, is it, oh, orbiter and planet, we've started to activate the proposition in long-term memory planets orbit the sun. We've retrieved that proposition from long-term memory. Let's do it in reverse now. Let's activate the proposition orbit planet sun. We're gonna, that means let the system think about that. What's it going to do? It's going to activate or excite the neurons to which it has excitatory synapses. In this case, planet plus orbiter and sun plus orbited. Ah, now we get to use those inhibitory connections we postulated. Those guys down here in the middle are going to inhibit each other. So only one of them is going to get to fire at first. Let's say that one. It'll excite the things to which it's connected, and they'll excite the things to which they're connected. And those features all the way down to the left are going to go on exciting things to which they're connected, or exciting the neurons to which they're connected. Whoops. All right? And that, that excitation is going to start to propagate upward through the network. Until by and by, the inhib inhibition here takes over and say this guy gets to fire, activating his bits and so forth. Before long, we've activated a representation of the electrons orbit the nucleus based on the pattern generated by the planets orbit the sun. We told the, planet, the system to think about the fact that planets orbit the sun, and that reminded it of the fact that the electrons orbit the nucleus. Now, in this figure and in a bunch that I'm going to show in the future, I'm going to use color to represent time. So the idea is that all the things that are in red are firing together. All the things in blue are firing together, and the red things are firing out of synchrony with the blue things. Anything in purple is firing with both. So there you go. OK. Like I just said, retrieving, right, this process retrieves electrons orbit nucleus from memory, OK, along with all of its parts. Look at how boring these ingredients are. This is boring, boring, boring. All I did was build up some neurons with some excitatory synapses, and now I've got you looking at this horrible graph up here and wondering where the hell we're going. Well, the process we just des described could be characterized as a kind of guided memory retrieval. It retrieved electrons orbit the nucleus guided by the patterns generated by the planets orbit the sun. And when it did that, structures activated by one proposition retrieved from memory uh, structures in the proposition corresponding to the other one. And corresponding structures got active at the same time with each other. So planets got active at the same time as electrons, and sun with nucleus, and so forth. What we're going to do is we're going to exploit this coincidence of, of activity to learn mappings between things. This is an idea that goes all the way back to the 1940s from Donald Hebb. What fires together, wires together. And there's lots of evidence for this in real neural networks. So we'll learn an excitatory connection from electrons to planets and from nucleus to sun and so forth for the binding units and so forth for the full-blown propositions. The system has just computed the mappings based on the role bindings. Holy shit. All based on really boring ingredients. What I've just described to you is, a, is the beginnings of a model of analogical reasoning that I developed in collaboration with Keith Holyoke and published a long time ago. The ingredients are boring, but this little algorithm turns out to account for a ton of what's known about how people reason using analogies. It also accounts for patterns of cognitive development. So how do children reason using analogies? How does their reasoning differ from adult reasoning? It even accounts for patterns of decline and aging. I got bad news for you. You're good at it now. When you get to be as old as I am, you'll be less good at it. When you get to be as old as I hope to maybe one day be or maybe not, you'll be even worse. Enjoy it while you got it. This shit goes away. And this approach provides an a priori account of things like the limitations of working memory, which I won't go into.
It also generates some novel predictions, which we've experimentally confirmed. It sounds simple and boring, but it's actually a very powerful algorithm. In fact, it's powerful enough that it's pretty straightforward, based on these principles, to generalize it and get an account of analogical inference, using those mappings to constrain inferences very naturally. This is another model that Holyoke and I published a little bit later. Same model, actually, just more phenomena. This one accounts for a bunch of phenomena in relational inference and what's called schema induction, the learning of new relational concepts. And what's crucial is that it's based on computational ingredients that are already present in non-human animals. They're just put together in a slightly different way. I'm going to skip that and just go straight to this. The way it does that learning of new concepts is based on something we call intersection discovery, which is that when things fire together, like, you sh like we saw there, what happens is that firing together makes it easy to see what they have in common and with the way they differ. The way they differ. And there's, we've built a learning algorithm that exploits that. It's trivial. And in so doing, it learns new relational concepts. The resulting model we call DORA. And this model accounts for a ton of stuff in cognitive development, like a whole crap load of stuff. Simple ingredients accounts for a lot of things about how your kids will develop when you have them. OK. So one of the points I want to make here is just that these little ingredients provide a powerful account of what your mind appears to be up to. So what happened? <clears throat> following is speculative, in the sense that it's based on logic rather than empirical data. So I use the word speculation only reluctantly. Phylogenetically, first we solve the binding problem. That is, the binding by time thing, that what goes together fires together. It's known that a lot of our primate cousins do this too. You stick electrodes into monkey visual cortex. They're representing bindings by coincidence of firing. This capacity made it possible for us to represent predicates. I assume that you all in computer science know what I mean by that. You predicate something, that means you represent it as an entity in itself. <coughs> Armed with the ability to represent bindings and predicates, <coughs> getting <coughs> a solution to the mapping problem follows next. Together, if you can solve mapping and represent predicates explicitly, then you can discover new relations. That's what we showed in our simulation work. And if you can do that, then you can represent relations as entities unto themselves. And if you can do that, now you've got what it takes to do role-based relational thinking. So what really happened? What I want to convince you of is that the crucial step is number two. We solved the mapping problem. Why do I think this is the crucial step? Because it's actually harder than I let on. First, it requires you to detect temporal coincidence at multiple hierarchical levels simultaneously. So to return to our little graph of electrons and planets, to do the, to do the mapping down here at the level of objects in relational roles, you're computing mappings over synaptic distance of two. Right? The, the excitation has to go from the one object down to the little features and back up to the other objects. That's synaptic distance two. Synapses take time, about 100 milliseconds to propagate over. No, 10 milliseconds, sorry. Time, nonetheless. At the next level, synaptic distance is four. At the next, it's six. Somehow, your brain has to coordinate all of this. This may require sophisticated routines for doing temporal integration that we have and our primate cousins lack. Whoa! Oh! Fail, John! I failed to put in the uh, appear line by line animation. So what you're doing now, in spite of me, is you're reading this whole fucking slide. Stop it! Let's go through it one point at a time, even though I screwed up. One. Um, or We've done one. Two. It turns out that the mapping problem is the most significant cognitive bottleneck in analogical reasoning. That's what gives people trouble. That's why it's on the SAT. 
it's ten, it's, this task is sensitive to formal task complexity, which I can define for you if you're curious, but I won't for now because I'm running out of time. It depends heavily on frontal cortex, the part of your brain in the front that, that may or may not differ most from the brains of other primates. How do we know that? It's late to develop in childhood. Frontal lobes develop late. It's susceptible to frontal damage due to things like age, injury, degeneration, like Alzheimer's disease. It's dependent on working memory capacity, which is also dependent on frontal, uh, on frontal cortex. That is, it's dependent, uh, again, on age, IQ. Those of you who are smarter are smarter because you're better at this part. Um, that's why analogy tasks are on the SAT. It's sensitive to fatigue. If you're tired, you do this less well. It's subject to distraction. It's sensitive to distraction. Anxiety. If I make you unhappy by making you count backward from 200 by 13, you'll do worse on this. It's sensitive to drunkenness, as most of you have noticed, or maybe you were too drunk to notice. In general, looking at the developmental and aging literature, it's the last thing to come in development, and it's the first thing to go when you age or drink. Again, as mentioned by Doug Hofstetter and others, really, this is why analogy is the core of cognition, because mapping is the core of analogy, and it's the core of other stuff, too. So, ooh, we're getting there. What ha this is what happened to us, I think. And this is what failed to happen to our primate cousins. They didn't solve step number two. And as a result, they haven't solved anything else yet. Why us and not them? Why did this happen to us? What was the selection pressure that led us to put them in zoos rather than vice versa? As my eighth grade science teacher would say, you want to get rich and famous? You figure out the answer to that question. Thank you. That's all I got. Happy to answer questions if there are any. Yes. Oh, okay, boy. You think <laughs> you think that was a speculation alert after that monk's line? Okay. Imagine that slide, but the whole fucking thing says speculation alert, and it's all like in bold font and stuff. I don't like to talk about consciousness. I'm not sure I actually believe in it. It's certainly not a scientific construct. Now, that doesn't stop me from speculating on it. If I had to speculate, the contents of consciousness are precisely whatever is synchronized into patterns like that. Um, I suspect there's a one-to-one -one mapping between them. But since I don't view it as a scientific question, I can say that knowing that it'll never actually be answered. I don't mean to diss your question. It's actually a very reasonable question. Um, and it's motivated by things like when consciousness is absent, so is this kind of synchronous activity. right? Or I should say, when we have some reason to suspect consciousness might be absent, like when the patient is anesthetized. right? If that's a good proxy for consciousness, then this seems to go with it. Uh, uh, this does go along with working memory. Uh, so the idea is that whatever you've got synchronized like this is what's in working memory, right? If working memory is the same as consciousness, then they're the same thing. That's, by the way, why this provides an a priori account of working memory limitations. The idea is there's only so much you can have active simultaneously but not synchronized with each other. Yes? Like, uh, we kind of analyze or compare. compare it to a lot of different things to understand and learn. But I, I, I'm just curious that sometimes pattern recognition, the innate ability of brain to recognize patterns or innate ability of the brain to uh, compare things, does it lead to wrong direction? Like, do we actually try to find out a pattern when there's no pattern or who uh, Get us in the wrong direction or something oh, like that. That is a, such a brilliant question. 
Right. So let me see if I can restate it correctly. I believe analogy is the core of cognition, right? But can it be that analogy can lead us down the wrong path? Absolutely. Those of you who have had classes with me know that right now I'm really fighting the temptation to get started. Don't trust analogies used by politicians. <laughs> Analogy is a very powerful tool of reasoning. But in contrast to Bayesian inference, analogy is inductive inference, right? It's very powerful inductive inference. But what that means is there's no guarantees, even if you do it right. In contrast to like statistical Bayesian inference, which if you're doing it right is a deductive enterprise, you can have much more confidence in your conclusions. Analogy is one of those things that leads to conclusions that can be incredibly seductive and totally wrong. Yes, people do this uh, all the time. Did I answer your question without ranting too much? Yes, is there, okay, the question was, is there any way we can train our brains to not follow that path? Yes, part of it is knowing when it's happening, right? And one way to know that is ask yourself, am I awake? Oh, then it's happening, right? And yeah, I mean, you can, if, if you know that people are going to reason by analogy, you can ask, themself, ask yourself, what analogy are they trying to get me to accept now, right? What, what, are they ta what are my biases knowledge are they tapping into? And is it really a good analogy? What parts of this domain of knowledge that are familiar to me are absent from their analogy and would totally change their conclusions? Does that make sense? Yes. I guess. I shouldn't be moderating. I'm not the moderator. I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, OK. So isn't part of the problem the way that we test animals, though, that we test them in a very anthropomorphic centric uh, fashion? What an awesome question. Isn't the problem with animal, with animal cognition the fact that we test them in a very anthropomorphic manner? And that, you have just, zoom, you can get rich and famous now. That is the issue in comparative cognition, right? On the one hand, you have the argument Look, you cannot give non-human animals human-like tasks to perform because they didn't evolve to do that. And when you give them that, it's like asking a short person to play basketball. It's just not fair, right? On the other hand, right, the other, the other side of that is, well, look, if you want to know whether they are capable of cognitive operation X, then on the one hand, you need to be sensitive to that. It's true. But as long as you can isolate cognitive operation X and show that they can't do it, well, then these two things don't have to be in conflict, right? Because you could say, right, they didn't evolve to do cognitive operation X. Ergo, they can't do cognitive operation X. And when I set up the task, even to be as friendly to what they did as possible, they still can't do it, right? So there's, on the one hand, you've got guys like Thomas L. and Call, who want to argue, look, apes are a lot like us than we think, right? The other tension in the comparative literature are people like Danny Povinelli, who say, look, apes are a lot like us than you think. And the bases of those two arguments are just what you and I talked about. So yes, that's always a danger. That's always a danger. Maybe we haven't given them the right task. Um, and that's the way science goes. Science itself is an inductive enterprise. Let's see, I think there's a guy down in the front. Uh, testing? Okay, good. Uh, so you were talking about um, like using a, I guess, relational database to come up with more mappings and stuff. But how do you get that started? Like, what's the first mapping that you would put in? Because you, like, in order to generate analogies from analogies, you need, you need a starting point, right? What is that starting point? Oh, great question. So the question is, how do you bootstrap this whole thing? In order to do analogy, you've got to have relations. And if relations come from the same processes that give rise to analogy, how do you, this is like totally circular, chicken egg problem? Absolutely, and indeed, for what it's worth, when I was still at UCLA, I had a new graduate student, Alex Dumas, who was an author on one of those things I cited. I said, hey, Alex, he was trying to figure out his first year project when he was, you know, in his graduate career. Alex, here's the greatest problem in cognitive science. Very high risk, do you want to take it on? Bless his black soul, he did. Um, almost wrecked his graduate career, but I think he solved it. 
you're absolutely right. There appears to be a circularity here. I think what happens is this. There's lots of evidence that little humans, babies, start off in the world much more holistic than adults are. That is to say, we, they don't break the world into its parts and so forth the way that adults do. But the machinery of analogy, specifically structure mapping, mapping, right, combined with intersection discovery, can allow them to compare things to each other, even holistic representations of things, pull out what they have in common. And doing this iteratively over and over and over again, it's not a coincidence that you're considered a, a minor until you're 18. Childhood in the human species lasts a long time, right? <clears throat> over and over and over again, over a great deal of time, you eventually abstract out and predicate more and more and more relational concepts. And this process feeds on itself. The initial representations are holistic. You get a few little predicated representations out of those by comparing them. Those then bootstrap the, pro the process, and it increases exponentially. I think that's how it happens. And that general story is the one that accounts for all those data in the cognitive development literature. Great question. There's a guy behind you, Cole. Um, how can we get better at making analogies? How can we get better at making analogies? Wow. The answer to that question is a course on its own. One answer, the depressing one, is you can't. Not in any general way. If you want to be, I mean, God, this is going to sound terrible. If you want to be better at analogy, step one, be smarter. And um, working memory capacity is largely innate. In the last mm, decade, there were some laboratories out of Johns Hopkins and other places that claimed to have general procedures for increasing working memory capacity. Remember I said mapping is the, is the sort of the crucial element? It's dependent on working memory capacity. If you could increase working memory capacity, you would get better at making analogies. The problem is you can't. Um, not in any domain general way. Now that said, you can improve in lots and lots and lots of ways at everything in, in domain-specific ways. So one way to get better at making analogies in a, in a particular domain is become expert at that domain. If you can compress in your working memory a complex idea, like let's say the Gaussian equation. You're a young person trying to understand the Gaussian, right? And to you, it's still 1 over square root 2 pi sigma squared times e to the negative 1 half, blah, 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 right? You've got to think about all that shit. That eats up your whole working memory. But if you can compile that into a single thing, right, that can be then unpacked later on easily, then you, it takes up less of your working memory to reason about it, right? And this can happen in domain-specific ways. So when you become an expert at database programming or whatever it is you do, you will have done that. You will be better at making analogies in that domain whether you try to be or not. But the sad conclusion from everything I know about working memory capacity is that you cannot increase working memory capacity writ large. So you can't become better at analogy in any general way. I wish it were not true, but it seems to be true. Does that answer your question? That's it. Uh, so the director of the School of Chemical Sciences here at UIUC, Dr. Jonathan Sweetler. He gave a great talk at Beckman arguing that connectome chauvinists are throwing away all the chemistry of the brain. So what role does neurotransmitters and chemistry have to play, or is it just a connectome that we should care about? Oh, what role does, oh boy, oh God, ah. Okay, this is another course, a semester-long course, this question. What role do neurotransmitters play in all this? I didn't actually hear the first part of your, I heard the very first part, I didn't hear the middle part of your question. I heard the third part of your question. This professor from chemistry spoke. He said X for some X. And then you asked, what role does neurotransmitters play? So I'm about to say something that's either totally consistent with what he said or totally inconsistent or something else entirely. Um, it plays a huge role, but only in a minor way. The, the neurotransmitters we have determine things like the temporal parameters of the way our particular neurons work, right? So the fact that 
uh, sodium potassium exchange across a differentially differentially permeable membrane. It's sort of the current with which individual neurons determine how much they're going to transmit to other neurons. That's an accident of evolution. It determines it based on the physics of sodium and potassium channels, yada, yada, yada. And that matters a lot if your brain is made out of things that use sodium and potassium, right? That said, what if we are in, for example, a uh, computer science department? So we're no longer bound by the sodium potassium bullshit. And we can build more efficient computing elements, right? Now, we're not constrained by that, right? We can, if we know the computational constraints, ha <laughs> therein lies the rub. If we understand the computation, if we understand the problem that has to be solved, and we have a better hardware engineering design that we can bring to bear on this, then we can escape those, those constraints. But for us biological organisms, unfortunately, we are bound to the physical parameters of sodium potassium exchange. Did I answer your question? Oh, good. So I think as computer scientists, we tend to have like a performance model of the brain that's pretty similar to computers, which is perhaps very inaccurate. Can you comment on how we sort of understand the performance of the brain? How do we understand the performance of the brain? For, for example, you talked about working set memory. Working memory, right. How do we understand the performance of the brain? Right, one hmm. truthful, short, truthful answer. Not all that well. Um, to the extent that we do understand it well, it's by virtue of bringing tools like information theory to bear on it, right? So we can bring information theoretic principles to bear on understanding small networks of neurons in the brain. We can't use those tools yet to understand gross cognitive behaviors like uh, analogy and so forth, right? Just because we're not there yet. Um, otherwise, our, our metrics for mind-brain performance are pretty crude. They're things like working memory capacity that can be operationalized in ways that do tend to converge, right? But so that different measures will give you the similar estimates for capacity and predict similar things. But the correlations are not as high in cognitive psychology as, there are, as they are in computer science for various reasons, one of which broadly is we don't understand how this system works as well as you guys understand how your systems work. Did that answer your question? And with that, I am into negative two minutes time. I thank you all very much for your patience and questions. <laughs>